welcome to this morning's uh, soldering automation debate. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Gary Goldberg from Promation and Robert Rush from Mectel. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, now, there's been a growing demand over recent years for uh, removing the uh, automating the process and removing the potential for defects in human error in hand soldering. Uh, this is bringing a lot of benefits with it. Uh, automating the process helps to uh, improve traceability and reliability. Uh, so we're here to debate the emerging trends. And uh, my first question is going to be, what are the key benefits to be gained from roboticizing the hand soldering process? Uh, we'll start with Robert. Sure. So. Basically, the key benefits improve product productivity, more efficiency, mm -hmm. and really, I think we found in the last year or so, as Metcal has really been in, entering this market, um, really it's complementing the existing solders as well. Um, we found more and more customers are coming to us and say, automation is great and productivity is great, but really, we're having a hard time even replacing our hand solders. So we want to have the ones we have do the specialty stuff, but yeah. we really want that human decision-making process to happen, but for everything else, it makes more sense to put it on a robot and, and execute it that way. So it's better better uh, allocation of resources, basically. Absolutely. I mean, it's yeah. unfortunately, it's, it's one of those things where less people are getting into that in, that part of the industry where they want to hand solder and they want to do that. They want to do high-tech stuff, mm -hmm. and they're not seeing that as something as, as value-add for that high-tech industry. Mm -hmm. And People are struggling to replace it. There's a rec training requirement you'll ha that customers, customers will have to go through every couple of years to recertify them to the standards, and it's a continual draw. The robots obviously need no recertification. They're going to do it the same way every single time you do it, right. and it really benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary, do you get anything to add to that on what the key benefits would be uh, for roboticizing the, the uh, hand soldering? Yeah. Um, Obviously, we uh, we look at it in the same way, but a little bit different. Um, again, labor is very, very difficult to find. Soldering is truly an art, whether it's selective or hot iron or robotic. And um, to prove this out, uh, what uh, what we did was is we actually gave a, a soldering robot uh, to one of our customers and asked them to do a complete analysis for us uh, over a period of 4,240 parts, and we pitted them in two different sequences. One, we're using a uh, 305 sack no clean, 2% flux core, and then we increased the flux core to a 3.2%. What the analysis yielded was even though while the operators were doing the rework real time, uh, the defect rate from the robot, even after rework, still outpaced the operators by almost 49 percent. Wow. When we increase the flux core content to 3.2 percent, and I want to just touch on why we do that, um, in a hand soldering world we're solder clean, solder clean, solder clean. In a robotics world we can solder 50 to 100 joints without cleaning, so flux is our friend, right. so to speak. And uh, when we did that we saw a um, the defect rate actually drop significantly <laughs> And the productivity went up almost two additional percent. So um, by adding adding flux to the process, actually improved the defect. Oh rate. yes. Oh. oh yes. Less defects. Less defects. Yeah. 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 So uh, in the robotics world right now, we always uh, tell our customers if you can go three, three point two, three point four percent, based upon the you know the joint structure, uh, you're definitely going to see benefits as well there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, how can a robot make a better solder joint than a really experienced engineer? Though, do you want to answer that one? Well, or? Uh, for Metcal's case, um, what we've done is we've in incorporated our connection validation technology. So, in addition to the visual part of setting up your process and making sure it looks good and it's got a nice fillet and everything else, but we've in incorporated our CV technology to actually understand the IMC formation there. So in our process, as we're going through joint to joint, we let the, the CV system determine when to go to the next joint based on IMC thickness right. rather than picking a time and saying be on here for X seconds. So it doesn't matter if it's got a light load or a heavy load, it'll be on there for the right amount of time and then move on. 
rather than something that's just pre-programmed in or, or, be, or idle. So for our process, we can look at it and say, we know these joints were good, they visually look good because we've, we can inspect it visually, but we know internally they're also, they're also good because we know the IMC formation has been formed correctly. So, so the solder tip basically touches the joint and it waits till it gets the, to the IMC or for a certain amount of time? Or it's it's, a, it's a, our patented algorithm that actually calculates the IMC formation in real time. Mm -hmm. And we use those control signals. We know the start of the solder event based on uh, a request for power from the, from the joint. Mm -hmm. We monitor that power and then calculate that IMC formation and then turn it off at the right time and say go to the next joint. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, well, yeah. From from our standpoint, to answer your question, um, an experienced programmer and an experienced solderer, mm -hmm. there is no difference. Right. Uh, the ultimate solder joint is probably the same. What the robot offers is it doesn't get tired after lunch. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take sick days or vacations, and what you see is uh, a, a consistent. Um, production output that over a period of time, whether it's a week or a month, you'll actually see a, a curve where the robot will just outperform any hand solder because it just doesn't tire. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a fair point. Um, so, so that's going to improve your reliability, I assume, uh, um, yeah, across the process. If the programmer, you know, obviously as good as the hand solder. I mean, yeah. it, as I said, it, it, it's an art. Uh, when you get into robotic soldering, obviously you have to understand solder formations, the, the classes of solders, uh, the alloy, uh, but really you also have to understand how to approach the joints, um, what tips to use, so forth, so on, to really optimize the process. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, you know, the, the soldering, the auto, automatic soldering process was very much uh, the precursor to this was uh, I guess selective soldering. You know, the, this, is, this is the first um, example of robotics coming into the soldering process. What what have we learned from these guys uh, that help you uh, with your roboticizing of the hand soldering process? Um, I, I would say I've learned that we can't do it all, like they can't do it all. Uh, right. Although we try to continually improve. Um, Really, selective soldering is a wonderful process. It's come a long way, and it's you know it's embraced now by the industry. Um, robotics is really designed to address the labor force issues. Mm -hmm. um, repetitive, uh, not necessarily a uh, rewarding job over time. Right. Um, it can be grueling, particularly if preheat's involved and the operator is sitting over preheaters, and and you know, I think it just allows the, the manufacturers today to be more com productive and to compete. Right. I mean, even with China's low labor rate, mm -hmm. they have soldering robots everywhere. Right. And, you know, because they just keep pushing the envelope. Right. So. Well, yeah, but Robert, I mean, I think the, the selective soldering process is something that if you've got any, when you're at a certain volume of joints and interconnections you're making, you can maybe put it through a... Uh, a selective system, but they've also had issues over the years with clogging and uh, all sorts of different things that, that come in. Uh, has, have you learned anything from that side of it? I, I think what we've really learned is it's, it's so important to make sure that you, you just take your time, make sure everything is set up correctly, keep the, keep the tools clean, keep everything kind of calibrated right, and just follow through that process, not try to get ahead of yourself. You know, it's always nice to say, let me turn the speeds all the way up as soon as I can. Well, learn, work your way up to it so that when you you run the, as fast as you need to, but not faster than you have to, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden, one little hiccup in there, you know, you didn't clean the, the, the feeder tube, and it's got flux buildup, and all of a sudden it starts jamming on you. You'll be, you'll be regretting it because you've wandered away and your robot's running and now you've got spaghetti coming out of your solder feeder, right? right? So you want, you, want, you want to just take your time and build up and then once it's up and running, make sure you're monitoring your processes over time and make sure that you're just taking that care. The same care you take with your operators, take similar care, but now you don't have to watch them 24-7 or you don't have to continually inspect them. The robots will do what they'll do, but you, you've got that advantage of that machine just running and going through uh, uh, the steps. But you've got to do that extra step because it, it needs to be told what to do. 
Okay. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. So can, can I add to that? Really? Yeah, of course. of course you can. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, when, um, can I use a name? Yeah. Uh, right. Apollo Seiko is probably the Xerox mm -hmm. of soldering. Mm -hmm. When they first introduced these robots, um, there, there weren't too many features on them. You know, they were they were kind of rude and crude, and it, it, you got what you put into it. Today, um, the robots have so many beneficial features: heated nitrogen, tip pressure monitoring systems. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Um, and and it really the the technology of the robot and the cost mm -hmm. keeps coming down, right? Uh, making it more affordable for everyone, and and so I think that's another key benefit as well, right? So that kind of leads into my next question in some ways. I mean, is, is robotic soldering uh, or soldering, is it, is it purely a, a rework uh, issue or is it really a production tool? I think it's both. I think, I think there's, a, there's definitely a place at the table in either, either realm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, doing production soldering, you're obviously going to put it on a conveyor keep that throughput rolling mm -hmm. so you can as long as the boards are moving and the robots are moving uh, so the robot form factor might be a little different than what you do on a rework machine where you pull it off and, and place mm -hmm. it off the, off the side yep. but I think it has a place at the table um, at this point we're not in a position to replace some of the connector you know for a, a connector or flex cable mm -hmm. or, which are perfectly suited for the robot to do mm -hmm. um, and but I think it's there I think uh, now we can get to the costs and the speed and the accuracy and the repeatability that it has a place in that line so that you don't have to pull things off. Right. Which, you know, anytime you pull it off the line, you're increasing the time and the cost of doing the part. So if you can put it on the line and have that robot do it for you, it just makes your product more efficient, less scrap, you know, more throughput, which mm -hmm. is the name of the game. So. Yeah, I, I think um, rework is definitely not the mainstream for a robot right now. Mm -hmm. um, when you remove a part, you change the dynamics of the pad, the soldering joint area, and it really requires uh, still the human factor, at least from what we're seeing. Um, the majority of uh, sales are really geared toward, I'm struggling with this product because it needs preheat, and, and or I'm getting a lot of inconsistencies. Um, I can't find skilled labor. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what... what our customers are trying to do is not only improve the factor, fa uh, the production factory output, but also trying to address other issues, whether it's human resource uh, or quality uh, within that. But you know, from my standpoint, Promation just isn't seeing hardly any rework. BGA rework machines are different than robotic soldering. So, so you're finding the, the, your robotic soldering systems have been brought into a production environment for, for small batch and... Oh, and, uh, no, high volume. High yeah. volume. Oh, yeah, high volume. Really? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 The, the systems today, Trevor, can mm -hmm. uh, can put down paste, solder, inspect, mm -hmm. uh, and then sort. Um, mm -hmm. You know, on, uh, if you go to the tabletop version, which is the most affordable, that type of uh, end customer... Is, is trying to replace their hand solderers mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. When you go to the inline, the automotive, uh, medical, they're looking for the consistency, the quality, and the output. Right. And uh, so it's, it's a different mindset of, of the robotic side. Right, right. Wow. So in this high mix environment that we're all working in today, I mean, uh, how easy are these systems to teach? I can well for, for my experience and on our on our systems, uh, you know we really looked at it when we were developing, just getting rid of the teach pendant, getting rid of that interface, and trying to do something different to ease that transition. I mean, when you're doing something, say for example, a high mix environment where they want to put boards on and off, they don't want that process to take a day or a week or whatever to do it. And we've, we've really looked at it a different way and say, how can we do this down where a joint can be programmed in seconds? And how can we then use tools like pattern recognition to then ease that process? So like program one or create a pattern, say a transistor can or something, mm -hmm. put it in as a pattern, say, okay, now find everything else on there and repeat that. So then I don't have to, pro you know, you don't have to program those points over and over again. You let the computer do the heavy lifting because that's what it's good at, mm -hmm. right? Then you just go in there, monitor it, maybe do a couple tweaks, and you're off and running. So that, that heavy lifting can be done mostly by the systems. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where we, we've looked at it and trying to push that forward um, it, to make it easier. Um, 
it's one of those things where we recognize that Metcal is a little late to the robotic soldering market per se, but we wanted to look at it differently and kind of shake things up a bit because we frankly didn't like the teach pendant. We didn't like that traditional approach and we wanted to try something different because we felt that customers would recognize that anyone can program it right. and anyone can go in there and actually use the system. So. Uh, you know, I, I realize every board's different, but I mean, have you got some sort of idea what an average board would take to program? To a single joint may take you 15 to 20 seconds to right. program, and then using the pattern recognition, take you another 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I think it took uh, I took a board of 72 joints, and it took me 15 minutes to program, and that was really of me just double checking to make sure I liked the order of operation, and mm -hmm. that double checking to make sure the joints were right. So it really took less than an hour to do up the entire board of, let's say, a four by three board of 150, 200 joints, something like that, and just run through it. So it really speeds up the process and allows you to move on to the next step, which is get production running. Yeah. Right. Okay. Gary? Um, we write everything to the fourth grade level, lots of pictures. Um, <laughs> it's just what we do. Um, you know, I'll agree that the programming's rather uh, simple with a control pendant, not, not like what Metcal is involved in right now. Um, so on those systems for us, we believe that anyone can be trained, even me. Mm. Um, literally, I could pick up a manual and, and program so the robot point, quickly. You're a point and click with a pendant. Uh, right? Yes, we are. And But we also have uh, array functions. So we have uh, slide solder functions. There's a, there's a whole lot of different functionality. Um, but again, I, I, I want to stress it's a little bit artful uh, particularly getting into tight areas or uh, instead of a straight down Z approach coming in on a slant or an angle mm -hmm. uh, to try to fit into certain areas. But but again, I, I think it's pretty simple these days. Okay. Yeah. So are there any sort of physical limitations uh, at the moment with uh, your robotic soldering system? Yeah, I, well, uh, I'd say uh, some of the applications we're seeing are almost three-dimensional, where they're, they're wanting to do almost assemblies on the robot, mm. and depending on the style of robot you're doing, they may not be well suited for that. Um, so it either it's a more complicated fixture to either hold it in different orientation as you move through it, mm -hmm. um, we've seen all those, or it's parts that are so small um, that you really got to make sure you've programmed it exactly right um, to accomplish the task because it's, it's just so challenging to get into those small spaces when you're talking it, your, your pad size is so small and you only want to do two joints right. but to get to those two joints you have to go through ten steps to be able to maneuver the system in there those, those are those are pretty challenging um, that's interesting because I mean um, you know 3D MID has been around for a long time uh, but one of the uh, issues with it was always the ability to to pick and place components onto these uh, 3D surfaces yeah. uh, and that has been in, in many ways uh, it's been corrected with this new machine from Yamaha, which is a robot that literally turns it into uh, the right orientation to get yeah. it planar to, to place the, the component onto it. Um, do we need something similar like that for the robotic process so that you can get good access to, to, to do your soldering? Oh boy, I'm going to say out of all the applications we see between wire attach, um, heavy thermal plane, just through hole, um, no, <laughs> no. The, the majority, you know, you asked what the limitations were. That mm. was the original question, yeah. I believe. I think the limitation is is that the robot will never have the dexterity of a, of a true human, will never have the true on-the-fly thought process, at least in my lifetime, yeah. I don't think. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, AI is coming, but... You know, for right now, is, a, is I'll call it a, a second step. Uh, the first step was, the, you know, the, the base models. Now we're in probably phase two. Um, the excitement is, is growing because of the features that are available. Mm -hmm. um, the features of, of 3D and some of the other things, um, even with the six-axis SCARA, are just not quite there yet. Not there yet. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. The other challenges we see are... Um, uh, solder joints and deep wells, I call them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because of the thermal feedback systems and, and other things that we use, uh, the tips are not always the thinnest in profile. And then you also have to get the solder feeder into that same area. 
Right. Right. So it's a little bit more space mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to use a robot, so right. to speak. Absolutely. What level of traceability uh, can we expect out of the uh, automatic robotic systems? Uh, one would assume you're going to get a much better, more accurate level of traceability. Yeah, from from our from our system, um, it, it's it's all the way down to we're pulling information from the cartridge itself mm -hmm. that's actually in, in inserted into the machine. Um, we have that that the ability to look at what's happening, and then marrying that up with the the actual solder process. So we know exactly what's happening at each step. We know whether that joint was successful or, or failed. And I think people are starting to look for that because they're going to want us to look at the same numbers that they're looking at their human operators as they're looking at the robot. And that robot's going to generate data way faster yeah. than a human will. Yeah. So you're going to be able to need to, to get pull that information out, communicate it, whether you plug in through your network connection, look sit at your desk and look at your dashboard and make sure that your robot's running to manage your processes. Um, but it's becoming more and more important. We, we constantly hear that request for even in the hand soldering world, and it's going to be even more important now because you don't have a person there to trace down and say, did Bob do a good job, mm -hmm. right? Now you say, did robot one, two, three do a good job, and what was he doing that day? When was the last time it was calibrated? Similar to your other tools in the factory. Right. So you want to be able to go back and say, we know when it was calibrated, we know when it was set up, we know what happened at the joint level, we know how the max temperature, time on joint, all of those little factors, and we can create a history of that solder board mm -hmm. and say this is exactly what happened during this process. So when someone says later on, well this failed, you're saying, well, everything on my end was good, I can, and I could prove it, right. right? So I think that's where the industry is eventually going, yep. um, just because that's where it needs to be. Yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Gary? Oh boy. <laughs> I'm a sticky wicket here. I I don't understand their technology very well. I can tell you that I'm not a PC-based soldering robot guy, mainly because of Windows. Okay. Um, everything we do is hard-coded for obvious reasons. You have power loss in certain parts of the world and other things, and it just doesn't allow the programs to go corrupt. Um, although um, there is a growing trend for network hand soldering stations, that I think uh, a PC complementing a hard-coded board to get the best of both worlds, uh, in my opinion, would probably be the best way to capture data and still maintain the integrity of the robot. Um, Hako, uh, Metcal, I'm sorry, maybe <laughs> see, I apologize, maybe seeing a different trend than we are. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know the main factory obviously ships about 300 robots a month so the trends we're seeing are not necessarily in the data collection at this point right. although they could be in the future yeah i think it will i think it's going to be a growing uh, requirement going, going yeah. forward to be honest yeah. okay we're well, coming to the end of our, our discussion guys uh and uh, a, a light-hearted end to it because my last question is will the future winner of the ipc world soldering contest uh, be a robot. I can answer this already. <laughs> can you? <laughs> yes. Uh, we were at the Space and uh, Space Expo down in Melbourne uh, several years ago, um, and we pitted our robot against their champion, yeah. and he he decided not to participate. Really? Yes. Wow. That's <laughs> an absolutely true story. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think the contest would have to change, mm -hmm. right? It would have to be something that to level the playing field a bit so that the robot didn't have take advantage of all the, the obvious advantage so you could handicap it a bit so that there'd be a possibility at least at least there's some doubt that it right. might go either way um, because because you think it'd be a no-brainer for the robot to win you know I, I think the robot once you program it it's going to do exactly the thing in the fastest possible time it's not going to sit there and second guess their actions they're not going to sit there and go ooh mm -hmm. I don't like how that do it back and touch it up a little bit right. and you know that the contest is basically get the board done in the shortest amount of time and then inspect well mm -hmm. well the robot's going to do all that as as a, as a function of the robot right? right so the robot will need to be ha challenged in different ways of how do I do this and how do I do that to really separate it from the pack but I could see separate contests and eventually mm -hmm. you know w w you know an entirely different test mm -hmm. uh, assuming there's ro there's operators left after 20 years <laughs> you know so <laughs> Yeah. Wow. That's okay, well, <laughs> fascinating debate, guys. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you both for joining us. Uh, Robert Roche from Metcal and, of course, Gary Goldberg from Promation. Uh, that brings us to the end of today's um, uh, panel discussion on automatic robotic soldering. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah.